extension of the films of Melies, Griffith, and Lang. Live action combined with large-scale mechanical effects and Willis O'Brien's innovative stop-motion animation created a compelling sense of reality. Much of the background of this cave set scene has been painted on glass. Intricate miniature sets have been combined with previously photographed live action projected onto miniature screens camouflaged by rock. Adding the 18-inch stop-motion Kong creates a scene of astonishing realism. seven major studios and there were effects departments in all of them. Fortunately at RKO, uh, being the smallest studio, we did everything in the one department and therefore I had the opportunity of learning uh, uh, by working in all these categories. Since the studios closed, then naturally there had to be independent effects houses to handle all this work and many of the fellows that worked in the studios opened up their own places like I did and carried on into the independent field. What we've done is basically become the effects department for the studios. We're like a little mini studio ourselves. We have all the various departments under one roof that uh, enable us to do visual effects from start to finish. If I'd walk around uh, the studio in my mind, you would have the art department, you'd have the production office, you'd have uh, the shooting stage, the model shop, uh, the matte painting department, you'd have uh, film processing, animation, optical, uh, editorial, of course, uh, projection, engineering, both electronic and mechanical. All these are various departments, and, and, and the, the beauty of having them all under one roof is there's a cross-pollinization that happens, so that somebody from another department may even come up with an idea that, that will affect you. So it's, it's a great uh, sort of think tank approach to uh, creating sort of impossible images in a lot of cases. The, the talented person, and peculiarly talented in, in terms of future think, he thinks in terms of how uh, designs will be uh, in the next century or you know and, and and he has a real good sense of that and he's a great designer on top of that so not only does he know how it will look he knows how to make it look that way the rocket ships all those set designs were were done specifically to make the story more dramatic and more entertaining and more believable to a, a large audience Sid does not design every section and every piece. Uh, it's, it's a feeling that he comes across, and, then, and so you need to have uh, basically an architect who can take that basic conceptual idea and, and, and make it uh, work in all of the various details of the model. Models are used when uh, either the real article is not available or it's, uh, it, for instance, in a spaceship, it doesn't exist, so you have to build a new model. Um, for instance, back in the old days, when, uh, say they needed an ancient castle, obviously in Hollywood or, or Los Angeles, there, there are no castles, so they have to be built in miniature. During Die Hard, they would not allow us to damage the Fox Plaza building, so we had to build miniatures of the Fox Plaza, and then crash the helicopter off the top of it. With miniature pyrotechnics, you have to make everything burn much slower 
they'd still have enough power to destroy the, the device. The helicopter was ignited, then a computer was triggered, which lit the fire on the building, threw the helicopter off. We were basically hired to patch up problems they couldn't get in live action. On Ghostbusters, I was called in to oversee the Terror Dog characters. I redesigned them based on their concepts and then uh, sculpted uh, the miniature stop-motion puppet, which is a quarter scale. Uh, oversaw the uh, sculpting that Mike Hosh led of the larger, full-size versions because they worked both as stop-motion puppets and as full-size on-set props. And then uh, actually did the animation of the uh, characters when they were running around and leaping and doing all that sort of thing. Stop motion is a process that utilizes the uniqueness of the movie making illusion, where you uh, actually are seeing a series of still images projected in rapid succession to give the illusion of movement. With stop motion, you fool the mind by shooting a succession of still images in what you infer would be the uh, increments that they would appear had this character you're pushing around been moving in the real world, in real time. When you're ready to shoot the frame, you turn on the camera controller. It interlocks the camera and the projector. This character is photographed after the live action has been photographed. You shoot a frame of the uh, creature in conjunction with a single frame of movie film projected behind it. There are all sorts of ways uh, to bring creatures to life, of course. Stop motion is one of many. Hello, everyone. I'm the big new star of the big new movie, Gremlins 2, the new batch. And here's someone very special to tell you all about it. The technology is evolving so quickly that uh, the things that we're doing in this picture now, we couldn't have done six years ago in the other one. Because the lip sync is so difficult to perform live and takes so many people, uh, and because Terry Randall talks so quickly in this film, uh, I decided that the best way to do that is to pre-program all the, all the lip sync dialogue and perform the rest of it live. And we actually just program the upper lip first, and then the lower lip and the tongue and the jaw, each in a separate pass, and then the gilded lip will play it back at the, uh, at real time. Boy, this is a really good movie! And there you have it, a true unsolicited testimonial from Gizmo himself, in his very own words. So this is the Gizmo. You know he'd never lie to anyone. <laughs> If a little gizmo or a gremlin is crawling along the floor, there's usually a hole in the floor. And so it's always a big question mark as to where this hole needs to be. So first we start out with a small hole, about three inches, and then later on at the end of the day or the end of this, the shooting of this particular sequence, the set will look like Swiss cheese because there's holes all over the place. They're not three inches, but they're this big. In the second movie, we had uh, already had the experience of doing the first movie, so we were much more prepared and uh, knew pretty much what had been done before and what we wanted to do differently sequel you have to try to top the first picture and there were a lot of things that were just not technically possible for us on the time and budget that we have in the first movie um, that we knew we would have to have in this picture so when we went to Rick Baker um, when we were writing the script we tried to include him they came to me before the script was even finished and I said you know, why don't we do this why don't we do this and this would be a really thing to try you know and they added that stuff in the script and, and every day that we shot we made up stuff you know Joe says you know what what are we going to have him do today? You know, it's like, well, I don't know. What do you want him to do? Well, you know, I'm throwing stuff. You know, so, well, how about if we do this? And he goes, okay. So, you know, that's what was fun about working with Joe. He's real open for suggestion. So you create a character. We'll start with a, a two-dimensional sketch. They'll usually do drawings first, and sometimes full-color paintings. We sculpt the new features, make molds of those parts. In, in those molds, we put rubber, which has to be baked in the oven form rubber and it's painted and you put hair on it and the mechanics are built for it. it has facial mechanics it really varies for each scene I wouldn't exactly know how to tell somebody how to do 
and because on the surface it just looks like you point the camera at it and you turn it on and you turn it off. But in fact, the number of puppeteers there are and the amount of communication that has to go on to get even the simplest thing to happen when you want it, um, it's just something that comes with practice. Award-winning picture, The Abyss, required all the visual effects tricks known to create an environment seemingly without effects. The effects teams combined radically different environments, water and air, to create the illusion of a futuristic adventure 2,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. Jim had done a, a film, his very first attempt at uh, shooting underwater. He said that uh, basically sets that were left underwater overnight were destroyed by the following morning. So it was determined very early on uh, that we would shoot uh, in some sort of tank. During the filming of the live action sequences, divers were submerged six to seven hours a day in underwater sets. Scenes too complicated to shoot underwater were filmed in miniature on dry stages. Jim Cameron, who basically did most of the boarding, you know, along with John Bruno uh, for quite some time, came to DreamQuest along with other effects facilities uh, with the idea of breaking down the shots into specific categories or areas. And he came to DreamQuest with most of the uh, motion control type work. Boards were already complete, as, as you can probably see some of us we have up here. Essentially, what he wanted to do was find out our technique and ideas of how we would go about accomplishing the shots. So it did some thinking and uh, came up with some suggestions or ideas of new techniques that might allow the effects to look more realistic than probably could have been done with standard technology. And action, John. The director and effects teams built foam core mock-ups of the models and underwater sets to carefully choreograph and plan each scene as it would appear in the final film. Using videotape and stills of a cargo shipwreck 800 feet underwater as reference material, they returned to the stage to match the look of the abyss as closely as possible to reality. Okay, coming to the stop point. Oh, keep going, keep going. Okay. That's just a, to create a relationship. FX uh, 57 uh, is a shot where uh, Lindsay and the crew, the group, who are in the submersibles begin the reconnaissance and trying to find sunken submarines. Basically, what it is is a shot of, of three small submersibles going along the hull from the stern of the sub all the way to the bow of the broken nose of, of, of the sub. And again, it's being intercut with live action real footage of submersibles that they did in South Carolina in the big tank. What we did is we used the gantry um, system, the gantry motion control system, to hang the submersibles and then shot it using about six passes, some shot in smoke, some shot in clean air, and through the combination of the passes, filtration, and, and lighting, we're able to give the feeling that uh, we were shooting actually underwater. Most of the time, uh, when you're doing motion control work, you have separate film elements. In this case, having the actual models working in the same room, in the same environment, it allowed the lights from the submersibles, which were really the, were the only light source in the scene, to actually illuminate the background, which in this case was the sunken uh, Montana. When we started the abyss, we looked at using traditional techniques, in other words, shooting the subs against uh, a blue screen and compositing them into a background, in this case, a Triton submarine. The advantage the gantry system gave us was that we were able to do everything pretty much in camera. We, we spent the extra time to build this enormous rig, and it took much longer to program because instead of maybe uh, 8 or 12 axes of movement, suddenly we had 32 going all at once, all three submarines, and uh, in addition to the camera moves and any other little uh, gags we had going on at the time. The models on the particular part of the gantry were kind of special in the sense that they had to be self-contained. In other words, the submersibles had to have their own power sources, they had to contain the rear projectors, and they were quite large. Dave Goldberg was in charge of actually designing and coming up with a lot of solutions in constructing the models. A rear projection system was used within the submersibles to give the illusion of the actor actually being inside the craft piloting it. The film was shot of the actors in a full-size set prior to our shooting the miniatures and then used in a projector that was built and put inside the models. The finished illusion would be that even though you were looking at a miniature, you would be seeing live action 
people inside of it. The scenes are shot in separate passes in order to control exposure and color of each element. Using the technology of motion control, the effects teams duplicate the movements of each model perfectly for the final composite. The light from the miniature subs in smoke makes up one pass. Another pass in clean air uses still light in order to see the details of the model. The image of Lindsay is rear projected into the cockpit of the miniatures in a separate pass. The final composite is made up of these and other elements, including a pass for strobe lights and bubbles, which add to the underwater look of the scene. The sequences where Lindsay's outside of the, the broken down of deep core, and she's on literally on the edge of the abyss standing there, and she senses this colorful light, and this huge type of ship, kind of glass ship comes up. And so it's made up of a number of cuts. And the first one is, of course, is a wide angle shot where we see Lindsay and some of the wreckage in the edge of the abyss as we see the next ship rise up and over the edge. That was done dry for wet. In other words, Lindsay, who was actually a stunt person, shot a month later uh, at Harbor Star in San Pedro, was shot against a blue screen uh, in air. We then cut to a close-up where we're down low looking up as the Manta wing kind of passes over top and she reaches up and actually touches the surface. This one we're close enough that the bubbles and her regulator, and just the whole way that the uh, water moves and the bubbles come off the top of the Manta ship, required us to shoot it underwater. In order to give the illusion that her bubbles were coming in, in contact with the surface of the Manta ship, what we did is we hung plexiglass mirrors in the water at the plane of which the wing would actually coincide. These are the finished boards of the pseudopod sequence, which were the scenes exactly as we would have liked to see them. Looking these over, you know, we sat down one day and said, well, they can't be done. Uh, not by any means that, that I know of or other than computer graphics, but we were really nervous about CGI basically because at that time, CGI still, it still looked plastic. Here we were asking it to do water. So we talked about all these other ways one was replacement animation of acrylic pieces, but the, with the, the length of the shots required, we thought that would be insane. At this point, Dennis Muren of Industrial Light and Magic suggested Alias Research computer animation system to produce the pseudopod. Those tests showed uh, some possibility, but initially it looked a little chrome and still a little plastic, but it looked like it was possible at least to get all the motion that we needed. And then we figured if it didn't work, which which a lot of us were not really positive, that we would just cut the sequence shorter or we would light it dark. One of the most difficult problems facing the programmers was putting the actor's face on the head of the pseudopod. A laser scanning system was employed to generate the facial expressions when the pseudopod mimics the actor's faces. The resulting data was fed into the computer graphics system. best special effect is only as good as the actor's reaction to it. So if you have a, a really great effect and, a, and, a, and a, you cut to an actor who doesn't look like he's believing what he sees, then your effect is no good. When you create reality, they call it special effects. And it's not an effect, really. When you get through, it's reality. If you don't think it's reality, it's not a good job. I think that uh, visual effects will continue to expand and uh, as long as they continue to satisfy the audience's desire to be put in a place they couldn't otherwise possibly be put, they will continue to be successful. <laughs> Next.
Tech Tehran 2 tonight, New Zealand.